Very good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Bible class for this evening, where, of course, we are finishing our Habakkuk series with our brother John to the theme, Yet I Will Rejoice in the Lord, Habakkuk chapter 3. I've always been familiar with the first, you know, few verses of that chapter, but I've not done a lot with the rest of this chapter, so it'll be very interesting and looking forward to it. So uh, we're going to open... Uh, our class then with hymn 176 to be followed by prayer. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, Thou, the great eternal God, are high above our thoughts, worthy to be feared and adored by all your hands have wrought. We know, Father, that your righteousness is like great mountains, your judgments like a deep ocean. You preserve us all, Father. How excellent is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, we put our trust under the shadow of your wings. We are so thankful, Father, for the joy of sharing fellowship together around your word, knowing how freeing and comforting and instructive it is. We thank you for the safety in coming together, for the peace and security that we enjoy in this country. We thank you for this family unit, part of our beautiful worldwide an age-abiding family. We thank you for the living and transforming word that you're anointed, our Lord Jesus, lived for us. We pray that you would strengthen and open our minds and our hearts to be instructed 
in your words this night. Please, Father, comfort those who mourn as only you are able. For we look to the coming kingdom when songs and everlasting joy are on our heads and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Please heal our sick, we pray. Please bring us unto your kingdom. Bring Jesus Christ soon so that all the pain and suffering will go away and the beauty and peace of your righteousness will fill this earth. So we thank you for all your blessings, Father, and seek it upon our gathering this evening in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, just before we have our reading for tonight, our brother John is going to give us some hints on how we can uh, view this reading. Good evening, everyone. So tonight, we'll be looking at the final chapter of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3. And I must admit, it's not the easiest chapter. So I thought, just before we read it, we'll give a few hints what to look for. Um, so, what to look for in Habakkuk 3, which, and then we'll do the reading. So the first thing is um, a feature of Hebrew poetry. So Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme, because when you translate it into another language, you don't get that rhyming feature. So what it uses is parallel phrases or parallelism. Um, so you've got two phrases which are effectively saying the same thing, but often the second phrase is building on the first phrase. So as we go through Habakkuk 3, hopefully we'll all turn there. Just give one example of that. In Habakkuk 3 and verse 7, just look for the parallel phrases in this verse. Habakkuk 3 verse 7, I saw the tents of cushion in affliction. The second phrase is, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. So we can align the tents and the curtains and, and the two place names as well, Cushion and Midian, and also their reaction, the afflictions and trembling. So, and throughout Habakkuk 3, we get this parallel phrases, which can be very useful in trying to understand it. Now, the next one is the use of imagery in Habakkuk 3. It uses some, some vivid terms. I'll just give you one of them. Um, it uses the word mountain, and we all know what mountains are. Some people like climbing them, um, and they're fixed, they're immovable. But Habakkuk 3, something strange, something out of the ordinary happens in Habakkuk 3. So just be alert for use of imagery, things which are fixed and movable, some strange things happening. Um, now the next one, um, look for echoes and allusions to previous conquests. So Habakkuk 3 is all about the future mighty conquests of God, but there's a lot of allusions to previous conquests where God has acted. So we've just got to be alert and, and get our minds thinking. And I believe some of the young people are studying Exodus 1 to 15. There might be an allusion to one of those chapters. So just be alert to that. Um, just a few more similarities with other end time prophecies. So we're quite familiar with uh, Ezekiel 38 and Joel 3, Daniel 2 and so on. What similarity, as we go through Habakkuk 3, do we find with other end-time prophecies? Of course, a, a good one always is to look for repeated words, ideas, themes which come up. There are a few in this chapter. And the final one is, how does it all end up? What's, what's the outcome? What's the result of the events described in this chapter? So just as we read it now, and I'll call Brother Johnny Ford now, he's going to read it. Um, just try and look for these things, and that hopefully will, will help us as we go through tonight. All right, reading Habakkuk chapter 3. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigenoth. O Yahweh, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Yahweh, revive your works in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was the light, the light he had rays flashing from his hand. 
and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O Yahweh, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the river, rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? That you, you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation. Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the waters passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation, and the light of your arrows they sorry, at the light of your arrows they went. At the shining of your glittering spear, you marched through the land in indignation, you trampled the nations in anger. You went forth from the salvation of your pe- sorry, you went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked, by laying bare from the foundation to neck. You thrust through with his own arrows the heads of the villagers. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. They re- their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses, through the heaps of great waters. When I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labour of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, Though the flocks may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in Yahweh, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Yahweh Elohim is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Right, let's listen with keenness to our brother John. Okay, so uh, brothers and sisters, young people, and also those listening online. So we come to our final night on the book of Habakkuk, which really is the culmination of this prophecy. As now in chapter 3 of Habakkuk, Habakkuk is seen to rise out of his despondency, his despair caused by the current situation around him as he contemplates in this chapter the mighty conquests of God and the hope that he can have in him. Now we want to start by underlining and emphasizing a couple of key verses in chapter 2. We actually finished off with these last time, but they do help in our understanding of chapter 3 of the book of Habakkuk. So the first is Habakkuk 2 and verse 14. So we remember from last time, Habakkuk 2 in a strong section about the five woes, the judgments which were going to come upon the invader Babylon. God says these well-known words of Habakkuk 2 and verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. And, And this really is the time that we really look forward to, the time when God's glory will fill the whole earth, something God likes, something that God is happy with, something in accordance to his principles, the whole earth will be filled with that. And, it's, and that verse is set in absolute contrast to the ambitions 
and desires of a kingdom of, of men represented by Babylon. Babylon wanted to fill the earth with their doctrine, with their thoughts, their ideas, their ways. God says in verse 14, no. Their ambitions, Babylon's ambitions will cease. And in contrast, God's glory, God's praise will, will be seen everywhere, in every country, every continent. And so we ask the question then, when is verse 14 going to come about? And how will verse 14 come about? I mean, it's so different, such, such a dramatic change to what we experience now in this earth. Well, a, ha- a chapter in Habakkuk 3 explains both when and how God's glory will fill the whole earth. And the other verse we want to highlight is verse 20 of Habakkuk 2. So Habakkuk 2 verse 20 says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And again, in contrast to Babylon, who sought to be in control and command over the peoples of the earth, who thought their gods, their idols, more powerful than any other gods in the world, God says that no, he, Yahweh, the Almighty, is the living God, and he is in his holy temple. So let all the earth keep silence before him, every single person. So it's saying God is in total control, God is in total command. He deserves that respect from all peoples. Unfortunately, it's not happening in our world now. People rebel. They do what they want to do. They don't do what God wants to do. But ultimately, there will come a time when this whole earth will be silenced before God and be in absolute respect and in awe of him. So again, when is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? Habakkuk 3 explains it for us. So Habakkuk 3 has been described as a model psalm. So it's in three parts. So it's got a title and superscription. And at the end, it's got the subscription to the chief singer on my string instruments. And and between those two points is the main body of the psalm. And and we suggested a small break up there. Verse 2 to 15, God's mighty conquests. And 3 verse 16 to the first part of 19, Habakkuk's confidence. So we start in verse 1 then, which says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shigionoth. So we're told Habakkuk is now going to pray to God, and he's going to reveal what he's seen in a vision. Now, there's some discussion on what that word Shigionoth means. We're just going to make a couple of points. The first is, it's a similar title to Psalm 7. We're not going to turn to Psalm 7 tonight, but it's a similar title. Psalm 7 title says, Shigion of David, which is a related word, singular form of this word here, Shigionoth. Now, there's debate over exactly what that word means, but the most plausible meaning put forward is that it means loud cries or to cry. And that cry is directed towards God. It's directed towards God in Psalm 7, directed towards God in Habakkuk 3 crying out for his help and his relief. And that's the meaning which J.W. Thirtle, in his book, um, Titles on the Psalms, uh, suggests. He bases that on Jesenius's lexicon. Now, if that is the case for the meaning of this word, Shigionoth, then it's a very apt title for this prayer or this psalm. And we can picture Habakkuk, the prophet, crying out aloud the phrases of this prayer, the psalm. The, the language really lends itself towards that as the prophet cries for deliverance of of God's people to preserve God's work alive and God's mighty conquests, despite the advances of the powerful invader. Now, the main part of the vision, which is verse verse 3 to 15, is sandwiched between two verses which Habakkuk describes uh, himself being affected by this vision. So, verse 2 and verse 16 give... Habakkuk's um, reaction and response to this vision. So I'm going to read from the ESV, which which puts, especially verse 16, a little bit clearer. So verse 2 from the ESV says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so verse 2 Habakkuk describes his reaction to God's speech, God's report, God's work. He says he's heard it, 
And this is the reaction he fears. God, I fear you. He causes this, the vision causes him to be in awe of God, to respect God, to exhort God in his mind. Now come to verse 16 of Habakkuk 3, where we see some similar words, where he picks up these same ideas again at the end of the main part of the vision. Habakkuk 3, 16 says, I hear, and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. So again, Habakkuk here in verse 16 picks up on that word hear or heard. And his reaction is given um, in more vivid terms than verse 2. What he saw was terrifying, was glorious, the roar and the awesome power of God. It made him tremble, his lips were quivering, his legs went to jelly, as it were. That's, that's how it physically affected him. And yet, knowing and understanding this vision, he says at the end of verse 16, yet I will quietly wait, or as... As the King James Version says, I might rest in the day of trouble. Because he knows this vision is all about God bringing great punishments on the people of God's enemy, um, the invader. So verse 2 and verse 16 use that word heard, when I heard, and then it shows his reaction. Now it's a very fitting way for the book to conclude because come back to Habakkuk 1 and verse 2. Because Habakkuk here in verse 1 verse 2 uses that very same word. So this is how Habakkuk starts his book. In chapter 1 verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? You can cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. So Habakkuk starts his book by challenging God that God hasn't heard his prayer or his, his cry God hasn't acted in the earth to rid this earth of wickedness. He uses that very same word when, when he comes to chapter 3. And, but here in 1, chapter 1, verse 2, he says, it's God not hearing. And through the instruction and response of God in this prophecy, Habakkuk learned his perspective there in chapter 1, verse 2, wasn't quite right. It was, it was wrong. It wasn't God who needed to hear his cries. It was the prophet himself who needed to hear, and that's where he ends up in chapter 3, where he says in verse 2 and verse 16, I heard. I listened, I took God's message in, I understood it, and now in chapter 3, I realize just how awesome and wonderful and powerful God is, and that's affected my life. I feared God. I'm in absolute respect of him. I'm in awe of him, and so I'm going to wait patiently for the outworking of his purpose. And there's a really good lesson in that for us. And, and that is, we need to hear as well, similarly to Habakkuk. We need to hear what God says to us, to take it in, to understand it, let it affect our lives in the same way as it affected the prophet here. And as Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing. It's us doing the hearing, but hearing by the word of God. So the vision of God's mighty conquest comes between these two verses, verse 2 and verse 16. Now the last part of verse 16, it forms us of one of the main themes of what's happening here in chapter 3. Now, the, the ESV actually puts it clearer than the King James Version. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. So the vision is about God's judgments unleashed on this proud, powerful invader who comes against God's people. Chapter 3 is more than that. It's more than just judgments and punishments uh, seen in that sort of negative way. Come back to chapter 3, verse 2. Now, the very last words of chapter 3, verse 2. Habakkuk says, In wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk has seen and witnessed the, in this vision the great, the terrible wrath of God unleashed with great power on this powerful invader, caused him... To, to tremble violently. Ultimately, though, it's not about the dis destruction of the wicked, and that's it. Because God also shows mercy, which is a, a more positive and comforting aspect of, of this chapter. God's mercies will be great for his people. Yes, it's necessary for God to judge the earth with great judgments, to cleanse the earth 
of all evil and all sin, ultimate end of the final end, it's mercy. God's mercies will be great. And in that regard, come to verse 13 of Habakkuk 3. So just reading the first part of that verse, why does God do all this? What's, what's the whole point of his, of his mighty conquests? Verse 13, thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. So yes, there will be great terrible judgments which are described in very graphic form in this chapter. But in the end, salvation for God's people, God's mercies will be shown and revealed to them. But there's even more than that which is going to be accomplished by this chapter. Come back to verse 3 of Habakkuk 3. So Habakkuk 3, verse 3, says, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. So let's just concentrate on the last half of that verse for now, where we see it echoes the well-known words we started with this evening. Habakkuk 2, verse 14. Habakkuk 2, verse 14, for the earth shall be full of, filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And chapter 2, verse 14, is is looking forward in prospect to that time to come. Habakkuk 3, verse 3, though, it's happened. God's glory has covered the heavens. God's glory and praise. The earth was full of his praise. It's the fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, verse 14. That's what's happening in the ultimate end of of these things, of this vision in Habakkuk 3. That's where it's all headed. God... And God alone, glory to him, praise to him. That will fill, cover all the heavens and the whole earth. And that's positive, that's a good aim, that's a wonderful end. And very comforting to those who submit to God and are obedient to him. So his people who live by faith, by God's grace and mercy, will be there to enjoy such a time of blessing. So that last part of Habakkuk 3 verse 3 gives us a key on on which to hang the framework then of this vision, of this chapter. It gives us the end point, where it's all heading, where it's all going to end up. God's glory, God's praise will fill the whole earth. So how is that going to be achieved? How can such a massive transformation be affected from the world we know now to the state? God's glory will cover the world in totality. Well, let's go back to the start of verse 3. It requires something big, something massive, something unusual, something miraculous to happen. And that is, verse 3, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. Pause and consider that. So the word God there is, is the word Aloha, which is the singular form of Elohim. So it means mighty one, talking about a singular person. So in that verse, as as we just read it there, God himself is presented as personally coming and involved in what's happening in this chapter. Now, a bit more about that in a minute. So let's just look what God does in verse 3 specifically. God came or God comes. And that shows us that God has moved to do something. There's some form of action in verse 3 There's movement. He's going to take active steps to change the world to the picture presented in the last part of verse 3. Now, other verses in this prayer and this vision indicate this idea of movement and action and doing. So come to verse 8 of Habakkuk 3. So Habakkuk 3 verse 8. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thou didst ride upon thy horses and thy chariots of salvation. So God is described there in that verse as riding on his horses, on his chariot. It indicates God is moving. God is achieving things in the earth. Come to verse 12. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. So it describes God as marching. Again, there's, there's movement there. There's work, there's doing. And that, that verse we read in verse 13. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. God is going forth. God is taking action. He's doing something in this earth, in this chapter. 
So here, described in this vision, is the presence of God. It's God being revealed. So it's big, and it's massive. And, and that's why it's got the sealer there at, the, at that point in verse 3. Pause and consider that. God is coming. God is coming as a mighty warrior, moving in battle array against the powerful invader of his people. Now, we also want to note in chapter 3, verse 3, this coming is what God has already referred to back in Habakkuk 2, verse 3. We mentioned this this last time, but come back to Habakkuk 2, verse 3, where Habakkuk is told, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And that word come there in verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3, is the same as the word came in chapter 3, verse 3. Um, in chapter 2, verse 3, it's very emphatic. It comes, it comes. It's a repeated word in Hebrews. There's an emphasis on it. It's absolutely certain. And chapter 2, verse 3, is looking forward to it, to, to, to it coming in prospect. There seems to be some sort of slowness in chapter 2, verse 3, some sort of delay, but it is going to come. Chapter 3, verse 3, this time has come because God came from Timon. God rides, God marches, goes forth, coming to his people's aid. Now, it's useful to fit Habakkuk 3 into the framework of other end-time prophecies and passages that speak of the same time. So, let's come now to Zechariah 14. So, Zechariah 14, some well-known words, hopefully, to us. And we'll see some some allusions and, and, and echoes and similarities of Habakkuk 3. So Zechariah 14, verse, verse 1, where we're told, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Same word as in Habakkuk 3, verse 3. God came. It just tells, speaks to us. It's, it's in and around the same time. It's a desperate time for Israel because at the end of verse 1, thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Then verse 2, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not, shall not be cut off from the city. And we, we know this, this chapter is talking about Gog and his hosts besieging Jerusalem, taking it. They're victorious there in verse 2. They plunder the city. They inflict great destruction on Israel, who are in dire peril. They're weak. Israel are weak. Israel are not able to stand up to, to the might of Gog's host. They're about to be swallowed up, annihilated. And then, verse 3, we read, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So again, the same word as in Habakkuk 3, verse 13, the Lord go forth. Then shall the Lord go forth. There's this movement there, this, this action there by God. There's God at work for his people. And here is a manifestation of God, a revealing of God, who fights against Gog and his hosts and overcomes them and crushes them. And so, in what form, in what way is God revealed here in Zechariah? Well, let's go on to verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And he shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Aziel. Aziel, sorry. Yea, he shall flee like as he fled from the, before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And we know, and we won't go into this to prove it, but we know in verse 4, his feet talking about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we also note at the end of verse 5, who are with him, and it's all the saints with him. And so by this time in Zechariah 14, verse 4 and 5, Christ has already returned to the earth. The resurrection and the judgment have already happened, and now Christ and the saints with him act as God's representatives, representatives on the earth, to fight against this powerful, powerful invader and save Israel from their desperate plight. 
And that's what Habakkuk 3 verse 3 is referring to. It's not actually God himself coming. No one can see God and live. It's God revealed, God manifest in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, accompanied by saints to accomplish this work on his behalf. Now, we just want to notice the end result in Zechariah 14, verse 9, which is the same as Habakkuk 3. Zechariah 14, 9 says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. God's glory, God's praise, God's name will cover the whole earth. Same as Habakkuk 3, verse 3, the end of verse 3. So, so that gives us a framework in which to place our chapter tonight in Habakkuk 3. The events Habakkuk is, is describing there in that chapter, in his prayer, his, in his vision, is an in and around the same time as Zechariah 14 and also other end-time prophecies like Ezekiel 38 and Joel 3. Now, just one connection with Joel and Habakkuk. So come back to Joel chapter 3. So Joel 3, again, it's about the God's judgments on the nations in the end times. And Joel 3, and we're going to read from verse 12, where it says, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I, will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put it in the sickle, the harv- for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, or threshing, as the margin says, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So here, specifically in these verses, we, we, ha- we have a harvest depicted, uh, and also in verse 14, a valley of threshing, which, which the margin alludes to. And that's referring to Armageddon, a heap of sheaves, in the valley for judgment. We'll just come back to Habakkuk 3 and verse 12. So Habakkuk 3 verse 12 picks up on the same figure as speech as Joel does in Joel 3. So Habakkuk 3 verse 12 says, Thou didst march through the land in indignation, thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. So here the word thresh is used. Same figure of speech as Joel uses. And, and, And that suggests that Habakkuk 3 is, is about Armageddon, the judgment of the nations, in and around the same time as Joel 3 and Zechariah 14. So all these passages, and there are more, describing the same events. And, and each passage provides its own unique insight, which allows the whole picture from Scripture to be developed and, and seen. And that's true of Habakkuk 3, because Habakkuk 3... Uh, provides its own unique details and insight into the events um, around this time, which other passages, passages don't necessarily concentrate on as much. Now, to see this, come back to Habakkuk 3, verse 3. So Habakkuk 3, verse 3, um, we, it was described there how God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. And as we have mentioned Um, that's referring to God manifested or revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. And Psalm 16 16 says, Psalm 16 verse 10, uh, it refers to Christ as the Holy One. So it's it's quite fitting that the Lord Jesus Christ is revealing God in in this way. Now specifically, Habakkuk 3 verse 3 describes the root of Christ and the saints as they enter the Holy Land to engage the powerful invader. Timon means the south, and Mount Paran uh, was on the eastern edge of the Sinai Peninsula. It was the place where the the 12 spies were sent from uh, to search out the land, to spy out the land. Now, two other passages in Scripture provide similar details. So Deuteronomy 33 and Psalm 68. Now, we've got Deuteronomy 33 on the screen, um, and that provides even further details Um, which Habakkuk, uh, compared to Habakkuk. So Deuteronomy 33 says, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir, or Edom, and then he shined forth from Mount Paran. So we get the link there with with Habakkuk. And he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand 
went to fiery law for them. So from Deuteronomy 33, which, which is obviously linked with Habakkuk 3 verse 3, gives us more place names, uh, Sinai uh, and Seir and Edom. And notice that specific detail. He came with ten thousands of his saints. So the saints company with him there. So we can plot the course of Christ and the saints as they, they emerge from the judgment, which possibly and probably is in and around the Sinai region, and they follow a, a same similar route as the children of Israel did as, as they came into the land, going up from, from the north, northeast, then taking the king's highway, uh, going, going up through Edom, and then entering the land from, from the east, their purpose being to engage the invader and to save Israel and to establish the kingdom of God. Well, let's, let's move on in Habakkuk's vision to see other details that he portrays for us. And as, as we do so, let's, let's think of how Habakkuk can impress upon us, his readers tonight, the supreme and invisible, and invincible power and magnificence of God expressed in these conquests. How can, how can Habakkuk even begin to get across that this wasn't a normal occurrence, that this was special, that this was miraculous, this was unstoppable. Now, as we read through the next few verses, we just want to highlight some of the ways that Habakkuk does this. And the first is Habakkuk's use of poetry to impress very graphically this vision upon his reader and listener. So as we mentioned at the start, the main technique that he uses is to use those parallel phrases, um, that parallelism. The, the first phrase... And the second phrase, you can see they're, they're related to each other, but often the second phrase builds on the first phrase and gives more insight into the first phrase. And, and we saw that, there's, there's a phrase there in uh, verse 3, for example, God came from Timon, is, is coupled with the Holy One from Mount Paran. And, and so that second phrase adds more detail, more meaning um, to the, the first phrase. Also, at the end of verse 3, you, you've got that, that parallelism there. His glory covered the heavens... And the second phrase, coupled with the earth, is full of his praise. And, th and this vision, this psalm, is comprised of many of these parallel phrases which, which can aid our understanding and impress upon us the vividness, the richness, the depth of this description to impress us with God's work, God's majesty, God's might. And the other point we're, we're going to notice as we go through these verses is the use of symbols and imagery. So which, which we can easily relate to. So what symbols and imagery do we pick up on in our reading? Question for you. I mentioned one, didn't I? Mountain. What else? The sun and the moon in Bethlehem. Excellent. We can easily relate to the sun. Nice, strong sun. The moon as well. It's a fixed cycle every day. Anything else? Yep, burning coals. We'll see what that means in a moment. There's, there's quite a lot. And, and all these symbols and imageries are things we're used to, and they're also fixed and immovable. And Habakkuk is going to impress upon us God's power and majesty and might by showing us things that happen to these things that we consider fixed and immovable from our perspective. Things are going to happen to them which will never happen in our experience. And, and, and that impresses us with, with the power of God in this chapter. Okay, so let's come to verse 4, where we have a description of God revealed in his Son and his saints. Now, I'm going to read from the NASB, um, which puts it a little bit clearer, and some of these verses are a little bit, a bit, bit clearer than the King James Version. So, Habakkuk 3 verse 4 says, His radiance is like the sunlight." He has rays flashing from his hand, and there is the hiding of his power. So here is a description of God revealed in Christ and the saints. And the light in verse 4 of the King James Version has got the idea of sunlight that the NASB picks up on in that translation. And particularly, it can be used as, as the sunrise. It can signify the sunrise, sun coming over the horizon, uh, you see the first beams of light, and then it, it rises more and more, growing stronger and stronger. Now, 
The next phrase in verse 4 focuses on a specific aspect of that light. Now, the King James Version translates it as horns. He had horns coming out of his hand, which is a little bit of a tricky translation. Horns symbolize power, but that, that word horns can also equally refer to the idea of beams or rays of light that flow from the sun. So it's the idea of power flowing from the sun down to the earth. And there's several occurrences of that in scripture. And that's why the NASB translates it. He has rays flashing from his hand. And so the reference to his hand indicates he's ready for action, uh, letting God's light dispel the darkness of the world. Now, that last phrase of verse 4 is quite intriguing. And there is the hiding of his power. And that tends to suggest that at this stage, that the full shining forth of Christ and the saints' glory is not fully evident to the world. It's, it's like a sunrise. The sun just rises over the horizon. You get those first beams of light. You can't really feel the heat or see the strength of the light at that point, but it goes greater and greater in, in its cycle as it rises and, set, and it comes to its zenith at, at noonday in which all the intensity and the, the power and the heat and the light of the sun is fully felt. Fully felt. Uh, and that tends to suggest the picture here, that at this point, that the, the, that sun is coming up and that ultimately it ends up with God revealed himself to the whole world um, through the work of his son. Now, just another point on this picture of light. It's very appropriate for the Lord Jesus Christ. Malachi 4, verse 2, he's described there as the son of righteousness, who will ultimately bring and arise with healing in his beams for his people. Well, from that picture in verse 4, we now have a picture of destruction in verse 5, which says in the NASB, before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. And, and here we get these parallel phrases again. Before him, pestilence. After him, we get this, this burning coals, as the King James Version says, or burning plague or fever. This, this is how, or one of the ways, the nations are going to be subdued by Christ and the saints through pestilence and plague. It's a, it's a technique, it's a way which God has used before in the past. Um, for example, the plagues in the land of Egypt. And this verse, verse 5, shows us no one is going to stand, be able to stand before the path of Christ and the, and the saints. They're invincible as they move forward in the earth, causing this trail of destruction before him, before them. Well, verse 6 continues this vivid graphic language. Um, so verse 6 says, He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. And, and here in this verse, we, we see how Habakkuk is impressing upon us God's supreme power and might in his conquests. So we, we can relate to these everlasting mountains, these perpetual mountains, these ancient hills. I mean, they've been there from creation. We, we go out and see Mount Lofty, and it's always there. There's, there's no doubt about it. To, to our perspective, fixed, immovable. Mountains, they're going to continue to be there. And yet, before the coming of God in Christ and the saints, they're described as crumbling, scattering, trembling, shattering, bowing, bound down, flattened before him. And that shows how great and mighty is our God and his work. The earthquakes, it moves at the presence of God. Things that we consider fixed, immovable, before God, dramatically altered. And that impresses us. This is miraculous. This is cataclysmic. This is transforming for the earth. Well, that's purely on a natural level, but these symbols also represent peoples and nations and empires, which, which verse 6 alludes to, because the parallel phrase to he stood and surveyed the earth is the next one. He looked and startled the nations. So all God needs to do is look, 
and all nations will tremble before him, Christ and the saints, will be driven asunder. And, and so it, it seems to be getting us to think of the earth and the mountains and the hills as, as represented by peoples and nations ruling over others. Now, just a verse to back that up. Come to Jeremiah 51. It's Jeremiah 51. This is a chapter about Babylon. It's very fitting for the prophecy of Habakkuk. So, Jeremiah 51. And Jeremiah 51, it's God's judgments against Babylon. Look how Babylon is alluded to in verse 24 and 25. So, Jeremiah 51, verse 24 says, I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth. And I will stretch out mine hand upon thee, roll thee down from the rocks, I will make thee a burnt mountain. And so here, Babylon is referred to by God as a mountain, a destroying mountain. Um, it's, it's great empire. It's referred to in that way. Um, so that's, that's the sort of imagery that I believe that we can take in to Habakkuk chapter 3. The mountains, the hills re refer to those, those ruling powers which will come crashing down before Christ and the saints. Well, let's come back to Habakkuk 3 and continue reading in verse 7. So Habakkuk 3 verse 7 from the NASB again. I saw the tents of cushion and a distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Now, verse 7, we've got the only mention of a specific people in this vision, Cushan and Midian. Now, in the Bible, this, in Scripture, there's three locations of Cushan. Um, and the one here appears to relate in and around the area of Midian because of the parallel phrase, pr phrases in this verse. Um, and we also remember that Moses' wife was a, was a Cushite, and she was from the land of Midian. So verse 7 shows the reaction of these Arab peoples in response to Christ and the saints. So as Christ and the saints, they move up from the south and into the land of Israel, and they encounter these, these Arab nations, and we're told that Cushan and Midian, these people they were in affliction, they were in distress, they tremble before Christ and the saints. And it seems, and we can, we can sort of fit, that the Arab nations are the first to feel the effects of God's judgments, and, and they're subdued under Christ's rule, which we learn about from other passages such as Isaiah 60. Well, in verse 8, the vivid imagery continues even more. So, hopefully you can read that. Um, it says, was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? You stripped the sheaths from your bow, calling for many arrows, Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. And so now introduced into this picture, into this vision, are rivers and seas, raging waters, and, and from passages such as Isaiah 57 and verse 20. These, these symbols refer to the nations of peoples again. Uh, Isaiah 57 verse 20, the wicked are like the troubled sea. And, and it's evident from these verses, God is not happy. He's angry, he's full of indignation. And he's described here as an archer meeting out judgments, and we can sense the reaction of the, of the nations described in these terms, the boiling, the turbulent seas, and, and earthquakes again, and major upheavals as the powers of the earth are shaken and fall. So this is Daniel chapter 2 coming to pass. The stone smiting the image of Nebuchadnezzar on, it, on its feet, the kingdom of man, and breaking it to pieces, crushing it, grinding it to power. Now, Verse 11 and 12 continue on. More imagery. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. So here we've got the sun and the moon, which from our human perspective we can readily relate to, which always continue in their cycles. Every morning, 
We know the sun's going to rise. Every evening it's, it's going to set. And yet, here in this, these verses, this fixed law of nature is interrupted, stopped by this manifestation of the almighty God in his sun. Sun, moon, they stood still in their place, stopped moving. Their indefinite cycle was suspended before Christ and the saints. And again, that's on a purely natural level, which gets us to think of, of the great, supreme, majestic power of God. But from other scriptures, we know that the sun and the moon represent ruling powers and religious systems. And so Habakkuk 3 verse 11 describes the time when the ruling powers, religious systems of this world will cease and new bodies will be installed. There will be a new heavens and a new earth and God's divine ruler appointed who will reign the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we've gone through these verses, we can gain a sense of God's mighty conquests in this earth at this time. And there's been several references to God's feelings and God's attitude, um, terms such as wrath and anger, indignation, that keep coming up. So we we get the sense God is displeased and therefore moved to act in such a way. He sees the iniquity on the earth, gross evil, the immorality, and it really, really grieves him. It's it's so different, so far from the end and the purpose he has in mind. So he's going to sweep clean the earth to ensure his purpose is fulfilled. Now, it's, it's hard to comprehend the scale of the destruction of all this. We, we get a sense from Daniel 12, verse 1, there shall be time of trouble such as never was, but it is very, very necessary so that God can cleanse the world of filth, of sinfulness, of wickedness, and of flesh. And so get that picture of Habakkuk 3, verse 3. Ultimately, earth will be full of God's glory, everything that he wants. Now, there is another aspect of Habakkuk 3 which we want to consider. Now, the chapter is future in its application, but it also alludes to several victories and conquests of God in the past. And and that was one of the points we came up with um, before our reading. So what victories in the past does it allude to? Question for you. Sorry, I'm your honor. Joshua? Yep, Joshua 10. Do you remember Joshua 10? Sun and the moon stopped its cycle. Um, yeah, it's a good one. What other victories in the past? Judges 5. Judges 5, yes. Yeah, we're going to turn to that in a moment in a bit more detail. What other ones? Who's got a conference? Anything in relation to conference? Passing through the Red Sea, waters, overflowing waters, chariots, chariots of, uh, um, of Egyptians. Well, they got bogged down, didn't they? Broke apart. But God's depicted in this, in this chapter with his chariot, rides through those waters, rides through those seas, eclipses the Egyptians. Any other victories? Well, there are more. Um, Gideon's victory. Remember his victory over the Midianites in Judges 7 and 8? Um, where the tents of Midian, Habakkuk 3 verse 7, actually did tremble. Um, there's also allusions to God's deliverance to David in Psalm 18. Um, God rescues David from, from, his, from his enemies. So there's lots and lots of allusions um, to God's past victories um, in, in, in this chapter in Habakkuk 3. It actually fits in with Zechariah 14 verse 3. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So as God has fought in the past, is how he's going to fight in the future. And that get, gets us to think about the basis and the foundation of, of God's future conquests in the future. Now, come back to Habakkuk 3 and verse 2. There's a word in verse 2 which, which gives us to, gives to indicate that we should go back and think about God's victories in the past. So Habakkuk 3 verse 2 said, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. The word revive there, it's got the sense of let your work come to life again. As you have worked and achieved great victories in the past, so act in the same way in the future 
the appointed time. And that's why we have reference after reference, allusion back to God's victories in the past. Now, we want to look at one of those back in Judges 4 and 5. Well, in particular, Judges 5, which is the song of Deborah and Barak. <clears throat> so, Judges 5, let's read from verse 4, and we all know the story, hopefully. Uh, Judges 5, verse 4, it says, Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water, for the mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. And so, in that, those verses, we see an allusion to Habakkuk 3. Lord, when you went out of Seir, marched out of the field of Edom, depicting God in Judges, Judges 5 going up, moving northwards through the land of Seir, through the land of Edom, then coming into the land. Habakkuk 3, verse 3, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. comes from the same direction. Also, earth trembled, Judges 5. Habakkuk 3, verse 10, the mountains saw thee and they trembled. Mountains melted, Judges 5. Everlasting mountains were scattered in Habakkuk 3, verse 6. Very, very similar language, majestic language of God at work. We'll just go to a couple more verses in 20, verse 20 and 21 in Judges 5. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. O oh, my soul, there was trodden down strength. And so we have a reference. They fought from heaven. A reference to the constellations up there, the stars. Very similar to the sun, the moon. They stood still. And also River Kishon overflowed, which is why Sisera's chariots got bogged down. And talked in Habakkuk 3 of the overflowing of the water passed by, deep uttered his voice, and so on. So a lot, a lot of allusions. And there's another one as well. Because we know how it all ended up. Judges 5, verse 26. Uh, this is Jael. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. Come to Habakkuk 3, verse 13, with that picture in mind. So, we're coming now to the conclusion of, of that part of the vision in Habakkuk 3. And these verses in Habakkuk 3, verse 13 and 14, present the, the concluding picture, the end of the matter. Habakkuk 3, verse 13 and 14, reading from the ESV, You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as, it, as if to devour the poor in secret. And so described in graphic terms is that the head, the house of the wicked, is crushed, is pierced, is dealt a deathly blow, and which is an allusion back to Judges 5, verse 26, how Jael ended the matter there, through a deadly blow to Sisera's head. Yes, that word head is Rosh, which reminds us of what passage? Ezekiel 38. Yeah, another link with those end time prophecies. Also, the other allusion in Habakkuk 3, verse 13 and 14, which also Judges 5 alludes back to, is Genesis 3, verse 15. This is where the source of the problem all began, Genesis 3, verse 15. And that's where the serpent, the flesh, our nature, temptation will be dealt a deathly blow. Genesis 3 verse 15, looking forward in prospects many thousands of years in, in the future. Uh, look forward to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ crushed the serpent in his own, his own flesh, in his own body. So making, way the, making the way of salvation open. Now in Habakkuk 3, he's finishing off that work for the whole world. Here's the final end, the ultimate end, the head, the house of the wicked, the serpent, is bruised, is crushed, destroyed for good. 
That's the work of the former Christ and the saints. The other point to notice in Habakkuk 3, verse 13, did you notice that word anointed? So thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed, it's the word Messiah. And so in this chapter, we have a hint at the amazing role of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He'll be the one whom God will use to perform this work. So we've seen throughout this psalm how Habakkuk weaves those past victories and recollections of how God acted in the past. Each of those examples, the nation or the person was powerless themselves to do anything. They, they couldn't conquer the mighty army that they faced. The children of Israel faced by this great barrier of the Red Sea, what could they do? What could Deborah and Barak do? These great chariots of, of, of Sisera's army. All they could do is rest in God, act by faith, whether they could stand still and see salvation of God, as the children of Israel had to do, or move down at God's command into the jaws, as it were, of the enemy, as Deborah and Barak did. Well, those past victories and conquests of God, they give us confidence and faith. He's mighty, he's powerful, he can accomplish great things. He's invincible, he's unstoppable. And so that makes this future conquest so certain and so sure. It was certain and sure for Habakkuk, and it can be certain and sure for ourselves too. And so we've glimpsed the future in this chapter, and also we've, we've gone back to the past. Well, what about the present? How does all this affect us right now? How did it affect Habakkuk right then in the situation he was in? Well, in the last few verses of this chapter, he brings it back to his present situation. We saw in verse 16 that despite all he had seen, all he was going through, all he knew what was coming, the Babylonians, he said he would rest in the day of trouble, he would quietly wait. That's what he could do right then and there with that knowledge. He would wait patiently and live by faith as he looks forward to and longs for that time of salvation and God's glory. What does that really mean in practice? Well, let's read verse 17. So Habakkuk says there, although the fig tree shall not blossom, Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stores. So here we've got a scene of utter desolation. Barrenness, rural disaster, everything has failed. Fig tree, the vines, the olives, the flocks, there's nothing left. What a dire picture. The other point we should make about verse 17 is all those are symbols of Israel. We can prove that from other scripture. Israel are likened to the fig tree, the olives, the vine, and so on. And so the picture painted by this verse, not just the natural, sort of purely on the natural level, it also indicates the deeper spiritual barrenness in the nation, spiritually unfruitful. So what a dire picture. And yet in the midst of this calamity, the dire situation, Habakkuk says, verse 18, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon mine hind places. So despite everything going on around him in the present, despite the terrible spiritual state of the nation, Habakkuk says in verse 18, he is going to jump for joy, which is the meaning of that word rejoice. His joy would be in the God of his salvation. So what's, what's changed in the present for Habakkuk himself since the start of the book? The situation in Judah hasn't changed at all. God hasn't changed either, but something's changed now. And that was Habakkuk himself. His mindset, his perspective. He wasn't looking at the here and the now and the dire situation and getting caught up in all the anxieties of that. Habakkuk now is looking at the future vision of glory ahead of him and that energized him to give him great strength in God it developed that deep faith which could remove mountains he was confident now certain of the of the future his hope was assured and that led him to, to act in this way to wait patiently to live by faith a life devoted to his God now we noted last time in verse 19 he pictures himself running like that fast deer that, that doe 
runs effortlessly. Sure-footedly, securely up the steep, rack, rocky, craggy cliffs, unafraid and deterred by seemingly impassable terrain. That's what God's message, God's vision has done for Habakkuk himself, the prophet. He pictures himself running like that deer, sure-footed, secure reliance on his God as he rises above his immediate circumstances surrounding him to, to press on to attain new heights and focus in his life. And that's Habakkuk's motivation, Habakkuk's response as he understood and took to heart the vision which God gave him. That's what he's been energized and empowered to do. And that's, and that's the lesson for us. Habakkuk has been on a journey himself. And we need to go on the same journey as, as Habakkuk. As, as he started the book with questions, questioned God, why hasn't God acted? Why doesn't God hear? He felt despondent, he felt anxious, he felt down about various issues and challenges of life. We, we can be like Habakkuk as, as well. We can get down by, by things that we face in life. And yet we need to let God lead us and guide us through these questions and issues and worries and doubts which crop up in our lives to this point of, of absolute peace that Habakkuk comes to at the end of his book. Absolute calm assurance as, as Habakkuk's rock now is in his God and shakeable conviction in his God. Our God will act our God has seen, our God has a solution. And th this picture here in Habakkuk 3 is going to come to pass. The ultimate end, God's glory, will fill the whole earth. And so, with such knowledge, our minds can be fortified and we, we can cry out with Habakkuk in those verses, yet I will rejoice in Yahweh, I will joy in the God of my salvation. On your behalf, I'd like to thank our brother John for uh, so very uh, um, vividly bringing us to that amazing conclusion. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because of those amazing accomplishment by the anointed, the Messiah, and his amazing work through his people of Israel. So for the hope of Israel, we have uh, what we have. So now let's have some announcements by our secretary. Thanks, Brother John. That concludes that study. And uh, so next week we've got um, Brother Shem McAllister leading us in the continuation of our James studies, James chapter 4. And the following week we've got Brother Stephen McFarlane to lead us that night. We're still to find out what the subject might be, the 26th of April. So collection this week is... Hebron. This week, um, as you know, uh, SYP is starting on a Saturday afternoon and going for eight days after that. Here at Brighton, we've got uh, on Sunday the Brother Barrett Law to exhort Sunday morning, Brother Phil Archer to chair, Brother Roger Dowling to read, and Sister. Caitlin Osborne to do the music Sunday morning. In the evening, Brother Dan Bill is to do the public lecture. Well, let's bring our uh, evening to a close in through a uh, prayer by our brother Dan Bill if we first sing hymn number 134.
O Yahweh, thou the mighty one that will shine forth in our world soon. We come before thee this night so thankful that we've been able to see this wonderful vision of that wonderful prophet Habakkuk and the journey that he went through to see thy grandeur and thy glory that not only had been seen in the past, but that that past gave him assurance that your will and glory will be seen once again with thy people in the earth very, in the very near future. And we thank you, Father, for that wonderful consolation that we have, that your word will be fulfilled and that we will joy and rejoice in thy salvation and when the earth will be full of the knowledge of the glory of thee. And yet, like Habakkuk, we sometimes struggle when we see the darkness in the world around us. We see our own personal troubles and troubles on every side and with our loved ones. And we, we doubt at times, Father, and yet we know that if we keep our mind focused upon Thee, upon Thy Word, that You will fulfil the desires of our heart, that You will give us that assured rest of thy son's return. So we thank you for the consolation that we have heard tonight. We thank you for the exhortation that we have heard. And we thank you for each other, Father, that we can now speak one to another of these things and encourage one another in the path of life. We pray for those that could not be here due to illness, and due to failing health, and pray thy blessing upon them to re to kindle that vision that we have seen in their hearts of the time when sorrow and sign will be no more. We bear up before thee those that are, are very sick, our brother Johnny, and we pray that thou would be with him and his family in these times. And we know, Father, that you are the God of all comfort. We come to thee mindful of our mortality, mindful of the hope that we have that it is sure and certain so we pray that they would be with us this night as on our, on our way home they will bless the food that you have graciously given once again your love that's tended to us each and every day and we praise and we honor thee and long for the time of that glorious sun rising and it is in the name of thy son that we come to thee now 